Okay, thank you. So hello everyone. Before I get started, I would like to say that I'm extremely honored to be part of this workshop on uh, Edge Principle and beyond. And also, um, to be 100% honest, I'm a little bit disappointed not to be able to meet you in person. Anyway, I remain happy that we can still be together uh, through internet. My talk is about uh, isometric embeddings of the uh, hyperbolic uh, plane, and more specifically about uh, limit sets of such embeddings. So uh, most of you are pretty aware of what an isometric map is, but to be crystal clear, I would like to uh, recall the definition. So we start with a Riemannian manifold and uh, a map from this Riemannian manifold into uh, some Euclidean space of dimension Q. And the map is isometric if it preserves the length of curves. So uh, in the picture, the chessboard uh, makes visible that the map on the left is isometric and the map on the right is not isometric. Is okay, am if, I the uh, only one who doesn't see uh, the... What? Am I the only one who does not see your pictures? You have a problem, Melanie? I, I, I don't see your pictures. Did you share your screen? Yes, yes. yes. I see it, at least here. I is can it... see it. Is oh, your okay. view on... on no, no, uh... don't worry. I'll, I'll, find, I'll find the problem. Don't worry. Please, please go on. Okay, okay, nice. Mm. So uh, I was explaining what was an isometric map. Mm. And now I move on just to write down what it means locally. So if you have a coordinate system, say for instance, uh, uh, your variable is x1, xn, then you, and you write the isometric condition, well, what you get is a set of uh, partial differential equations, nonlinear, involving the, uh, the inner product of the various derivatives of f and the coefficient of your uh, metric. So I would like to write the metric here in uh, that coordinate system. And I will also uh, introduce uh, the pullback of your Euclidean inner product by F, which is the following metric. So once again, the various derivatives, the inner product. Okay. So uh, basically your map is, uh, is isometric if the two metric coincides. And okay, this is going to give you uh, n time n plus one over two equations because, uh, because of the symmetry of the inner product. So uh, if you uh, want to solve this uh, system, Generically and locally, if you want to be sh have a hope to, to solve it, well, since you have n time n plus one over two constraints, you uh, need to know to have n time n plus one over two degrees of freedom. So this number n time n plus one over two is called the Janet dimension, and you are lead to. Uh, Think that you need your Euclidean space, your target space, to have a dimension which is greater than this Janet dimension. And this intuition is right. Uh, that's the, the, the Janet Cartan theorem. So if you start with a Riemannian manifold, n dimensional, which is a real analytic, 
then every point of M has a neighborhood which has a real analytic isometric embedding into EQ with Q uh, equal the Janet dimension. So this Janet dimension is like a dimensional barrier. If you are above this barrier, uh, you are uh, you, you can have many many at least at least locally you have many uh, isometric maps. Uh, if you uh, change the hypothesis, for instance, instead of real analytic, you want C infinity, then uh, you will need to add a linear term here. I think that just n, but I'm not completely sure. Okay. Uh, that was Nash that uh, uh, realized that our intuition is wrong if we reduce the uh, regularity to uh, be less than C2. So that's the celebrated Nash C1 embedding theorem. So to state this theorem, I need uh, a definition. I need to introduce what is a strictly short map. So a strictly short map between two Riemannian manifold is a map which uh, strictly shortens distances. So at the differential levels, that means that your the pullback of your inner product is less than your metric times a scalar factor, which is less than one. Um, if uh, your manifold is compact, each time you have an immersion of this manifold in EQ, well, up to an homotopy, you have obviously a strictly short map. So strictly short maps are as abundant as immersions if you are compact. If you are non-compact, this is no longer true. You can have an immersion and no a strictly short immersion. Okay, so now the theorem. So you start with your uh, Riemannian manifold and a strictly short uh, embedding inside EQ and the uh, condition on the dimension of uh, EQ is very weak just that uh, Q is greater than N plus one, so co-dimension one. So you have a strictly short embedding and uh, the theorem tells you that for every epsilon, you will uh, obtain a true C1 isometric embedding, which is C0 closed, so the supremum norm C0 close to your uh, strictly short embedding. So uh, the picture is the following. Uh, this is my uh, Riemannian manifold. Here, my strictly short map. And the theorem tells you that now you have a true uh, isometric embedding. Like this, in an epsilon uh, neighborhood of uh, the image. Okay, I did it. Uh, well, for the moment, that's all we have to know about uh, isometric uh, maps. And I would like to move on to the uh, other um, notion we need to understand at least the title of this, uh, of this talk. And uh, this, uh, this notion is the notion of limit set. So now we start with a non-compact manifold, MN, so in that picture, Mn is just a stupid plane. And a map from Mn into RQ. Uh, so my map is that one. So this is nothing else but uh, the inverse of the stereographic projection. <coughs> so it maps R2 onto my sphere minus the North Pole. OK. And now I consider a divergent sequence of points. So that one, for instance, x0, 0, zero. OK, x1, x2, and so on. And their images here. Well, if the sequence of the images uh, is converging, uh, this is the case in my picture. The convergence is towards the North Pole. 
then we say that the North Pole is a limit point of uh, my map F. The set of all limit, limit points of a given map F is denoted by L of F. And in that example, L of F is just M. All right. Uh, a definition. We say that a map F is closed if the limit set is empty, is void. OK. So now I would like to introduce an extension of the nash kuiper theorem. Uh, if you start with, alors, th th this extension theorem uh, is significant if your manifold is non-compact. So if there exists a closed, strictly short embedding F0, so closed uh, reminds us just say that your limit set is empty, then there exists a closed C1 isometric embedding F. And uh, as, as before, you can ask uh, your uh, map F to be close to F0 if you want. Okay, so one corollary is the following. Uh, Kuiper so, uh, deduced that the hyperbolic plane H2 has a C1 isometric embedding in E3, which is closed. So if you have the extension theorem in your pocket, oh, sorry, yes? Is it? No, nothing, nothing. That's okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, this corollary, if you have the, the um, if you assume that you have the extension of the, Navi no, the nash Kuiper theorem, then uh, the corollary is easy. You have just to construct a short map from H2 into E3 with an empty limit set. And uh, that was done by Kuiper explic explicitly. OK. I would like to uh, take advantage of this uh, corollary to introduce the Poincaré disk model of uh, the hyperbolic plane. So this model is uh, the interior of uh, two disks together with a metric, which is given here. So this metric is the Euclidean metric. with a conformal factor okay and so this is my conformal factor and observe that uh, if uh, you are moving towards the boundary of d2 so your distance at the origin is one this is uh, blowing up if you compute the Gaussian curvature of uh, this metric, you will get uh, a constant Gaussian curvature equals to minus one. And it is a well-known and celebrated theorem of uh, Hilbert, and then extended by Efimov, that if you have a, a surface with negative curvatures, uh, negative curvature, you cannot uh, immerse it inside uh, E3. So this is the uh, Hilbert and Efimov uh, theorem. So uh, this theorem, the hypothesis is that you have a regularity which is C2. And uh, of course, in the result of Kuiper, what I get is a C1 regularity. So I am below the, uh, well, uh, the ban of this uh, theorem. OK. It was pointed out by uh, Camille de Lelis in 2017 that the uh, result, the extension theorem of uh, Kuiper, was in fact very general. You have the same theorem for any limit set. So uh, if you start with a strictly short embedding with OK, then there exists a C1 isometric embedding with the same limit set. So for instance, uh, 
uh, if I um, if I apply it for uh, the um, Poincaré model, well, let us uh, find um, a strictly short embedding. For instance, you map your two disk into a sphere minus the North Pole. If you, the radius of the sphere is small enough, your uh, map is strictly short. So the theorem tells you that there exists, there exists a C1 isometric map of your hyperbolic two space with the same limit set. So the limit set of F is N. So the closure of the image is a sphere, <laughs> which is funny. So that's a, a odd and funny consequence. I don't know if that was noticed before, but OK. So that's a hyperbolic sphere. It is easy to construct a strictly short embedding. OK, OK, OK. As a consequence, there exists an hyperbolic sphere that is a C1 also, isometric this embedding. Also, this, holds yeah. this holds for Q equal to N. No, no dimension gap. I mean, no dimension. So we have to add one dimension. In our, in our but they didn't have three. In our three. Ah, OK. Oh. Ah, it's an R3. OK, sorry. <laughs> OK, sorry. I, I have some difficulty to hear the question. So is yeah, that the um, I was confused about the picture a little bit. It, it's fine. It's oh, fine. Uh, is that picture? We're good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> in, in one side, that's R2, and in, in the other side, that's E3. Yes. OK. So sorry, uh, uh, let us move to another uh, consequence of this uh, limit set extension theorem. So if I consider the stupid inclusion of uh, my two disks inside E2 and E2 inside E3, uh, this is uh, obviously a short embedding because uh, the, the hyperbolic metric is 4 over 1 minus uh, rho to the square, and all of this to the square times uh, your Euclidean metric. So the conformal factor is greater than uh, 4. And so that's less, that's greater, so h is greater than 4 times the Euclidean metric. So in particular, it's greater than just the Euclidean metric. And that means that F0 is strictly short. So limit set is just a circle here. So there exists a C1 isometric embedding such that the limit set, the limit, uh, set is a, a round circle. All right. And uh, in this talk, we are going to address uh, the following question. We uh, take a Jordan curve, so just a curve which is uh, homeomorphic to a circle. Does it bound a C1 immersed hyperbolic disk? So here I switch from uh, embedding to uh, in, embedded to immersed because obviously if your if your curve gamma is a knot, non-trivial knot, you have no hope to find any embedding. Uh, I say we because this is a joint work with these people, these four people. Roland Denis from the University of uh, Lyon. Francis Lazarus from Grenoble, the University of Grenoble. This was an attempt to uh, draw a B, Grenoble. Mélanie Taylor from uh, Luxembourg. And Boris Tiber, Grenoble, also. OK. Here are our results. So result one, if your gamma is a smooth immersed circle, so not any Jordan curve, but a smooth inner immersed circle in E3, then there exists a map defined on the wall D2, so uh, the interior and the boundary, uh, to uh, E3, such that, one, the restriction 
to the anterior is a C1 isometric immersion of H2. The limit set is your given gamma. And as the global map defined on the wall D2, F is beta older for any beta less than one. And if you uh, require your, your boundary to be, uh, uh, well, if the boundary is the boundary of an embedded disk, then F could be, uh, can be chosen to be an embedding. Uh, is a smooth means C1? Is a smooth, sorry? So smooth emerge curve, smooth means C1 or what, how smooth? Oh, no, smooth means, it means C infinity. Ah, C infinity, okay. Uh, okay, it's probably true. It's probably true with C, in the C1 case. Not absolutely completely sure right now, but I, I can think about it and give you a, and give you a, an answer later. Um, so <clears throat> some comments. So first, uh, here I consider I consider my uh, two disks, the interior of the two disks, so my uh, hyperbolic space, and uh, and what. And here, and here, the uh, C one isometric embedding, so of the interior, with a limit set which is gamma. So my limit set. Okay. In these two disks, I consider concentric disk or circle and with ready uh, with incre uh, increasing ready so the length the length of uh, these uh, circles is increasing toward infinity and in the image we have the same behavior since uh, the map is an isometry, so the length is going to infinity. But since my uh, curve gamma is uh, an immersion, its length is finite. So that's just a little bit odd just to think about the object in E3 and you are following your uh, your circles. The circle, the length uh, is going to infinity, and suddenly at the boundary, your length is finite. And this is nothing else but the fact that the length functional is lower semi-continuous. Uh, another observation: uh, if you consider not circle but a radius here and a point on the radius and the point at the boundary at infinity your uh, isometric map okay and the image of the image of my uh, radius so this is f of p, this is f of p inf infinity. Okay, so the length between p and p infinity is obviously uh, infinite. So that's the same thing here. And here is another a strange phenomenon. So any point of your boundary is at infinite distance of every point in of the interior. And third observation, I would like to point out that the regularity of the map as a global map defined on D2, this regularity is sharp in the following sense. If you uh, just suppose that F is a uh, beta older with beta equal to one. So F uh, would be a Lipschitz. 
then f would have an image of finite area, but the area of the hyperbolic disk is infinite, and this is not possible. OK. Uh, we have the same uh, sort of uh, result for the case of the hyperbolic sphere. So what we are, what we add uh, compared to the previous result about the uh, topological uh, hyperbolic sphere is that the map could be uh, taken to be beta older uh, globally and beta any beta less than one. Okay, result two. Now we are focusing on planar curve and uh, any planar curve. So uh, not immersed in general. Then there exists a topological embedding defined on the wall D2 such that the restriction on the interior is a C1 isometric embedding of H2 and the limit set is your uh, curve gamma. So uh, for instance, there exists a C1 isometric embedding of the hyperbolic disk bounded by a snowflake. So uh, maybe, you... okay. sorry. Uh, can you show if the PSL2 action extends to the boundary there? Uh, I hope so, yes. Be uh, because Zach, is, uh, I, if I am, If I am right, this action extends to an isometry of, uh, yes, I think so. I think the action uh, is going to extend to the boundary, yes. Oh, yeah, great, thanks. Um, okay, so. For like constant metric, if you take like hyperbolic metric of variable curvature, what this feels so true. So you you can see. So what what you are saying is that you are uh, uh, switching from the hyperbolic metric to the Euclidean metric. That's I'm I'm, I'm correct. I'm thinking about say hyperbolic, but not constant curvature. Say first. Ah, what happens in that case? Yes. That's the question. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I guess that what, uh, what we did uh, could be generalized uh, in that case. But I, I didn't do that. Well, I don't do that. So um, it could be that some details uh, may have some significance and uh, stop the program. But uh, I will bet that this is okay for any. Uh, any, any yeah. But, but negative curvature is central or also maybe not the same? Uh, as, as often with, uh, with the Nash Kuiper uh, theorem, curvature does not play any uh, crucial role. So my uh, feeling even if I don't check that in details, my feeling is that the curvature plays no, no true role in that. Uh, so probably this is a result for like any metric in any dimension, you have the same thing. Certainly, but I, 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 um, I wasn't motivated to do that for any metric and any manifold. <laughs> I, I found that more fun, funny to, funnier to do that for the hyperbolic space, in fact. Could you say a word about why you need more regularity in three dimensions than two? What? Oh, uh, maybe because uh, I am unable to prove this. So, well, my, my answer is that for the moment, I am unable to have the same results. So any uh, Jordan curve in uh, E3, but maybe because I haven't uh, found, we haven't found the the right way to do that. So I have no mathematical obstacle obstruction to offer you to answer to this question. Just the fact that for the moment, we are unable to do that. Ah, I feel you disappointed, but. 
Okay. So, uh, just a perspective with, uh, with the Riemann mapping theorem, so big theorem. So if I consider the interior of uh, gamma, so by the Jordan and Sean Fries uh, theorems, this interior is simply connected. And by the Riemann mapping theorem, uh, we have a biomorphic map from the interior of D2 into U. And this uh, biomorphic map uh, allows you to push forward the metric. So you endo, you equip, you equip U with an hyperbolic metric. And this does not depend on the biomorphic map you, uh, you choose. So uh, you, you may think of the result too about the realization of U with its hyperbolic metric as a surface on uh, C cross time uh, R and with the boundary uh, gamma. All right. So now I would like to engage into the proof of uh, result one. So I recall you this result one. So gamma is any smooth immersed circle in uh, Euclidean three space. So there exists a map defined on D2 such that one, two, three. Okay. So if you uh, just focus on the two first points, where are these two first points, uh, sorry, sorry for that, uh, are a consequence more or less of the limit set extension because uh, this limit set extension tells you that uh, if you have a short map uh, with this limit set, then you will get uh, a global map, of, um, an isometric map, sorry, with the same limit set. So uh, we can prove the first two points just by building explicitly a strictly short uh, map. So let's do that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I make blunders. Don't don't look at the screen, please. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So um, I would like to uh, build um, an immersion which is strictly short and which is uh, bounded by gamma. So to do that, well, I start with, uh, I start with the, uh, sorry, my given immersion. So my curve gamma is an immersed curve and this is the immersion gamma. And uh, well, that's a standard fact in the theory of immersion that this map gamma uh, can be extended not uniquely, of course, to a smooth immersion uh, G defined on uh, the wall D2. But obviously there is no reason why this map G uh, should be uh, strictly short. But since it is defined on a compact set, what you can say is that the pullback of uh, your inner product is uh, bounded by the Euclidean, uh, the inner product of R2 times a constant. And recall that our uh, hyperbolic metric has a conformal factor that blows up toward infinity. So that means that uh, close enough to the boundary of our disk the map G is going to be short. And now we are going to uh, build from G another map F0 by composing G with a diffeomorphism of the two disk, so that to make F0 strictly short. And due to the radial symmetry of H, we are going to choose a diffeomorphism of D2, which is radially symmetric. 
So uh, this is my uh, F0 map, so G uh, circle phi, phi, and phi is my diffeomorphism of D2. Since this diffeomorphism is radial, is a radial one, uh, it is enough to define what happens along the uh, one radius, and this is given by another diffeomorphism from 0, 1 to 0, 1. Okay. So now, if I uh, do the computation of the pullback, well, it is uh, straightforward to see that this pullback is bounded by uh, my former constant C and a new factor which involves uh, alpha. So alpha prime to the square and alpha to the square and rho to the square and so on. So now proving that F0 is short uh, is just proving that we have this inequality. So my uh, the conformal factor of my bound, here the conformal factor of H, and lambda any scalar less than one since we want to have a strictly uh, short map. So we have uh, an inequality to solve. And well, this is not absolutely straightforward, but this is not uh, really difficult. So I would like to uh, skip that part just to save time. So this is doable. And I would like to skip the detail. Well, just to uh, uh, convince you that I am not cheating, I just show you the big steps. So if you want to do a screenshot and okay, check that this is okay, but I am not doing any explain explanation, not giving any explanation. Uh, the family of diffeomorphism is going to uh, depend on a parameter C and uh, C has to be chosen conveniently with respect to his capital C and lambda so that to uh, get your inequality. Okay, so we have a short map. That means that uh, we have proven the two first points. To get to the third one, we have to uh, dive uh, m deeper into the Nash and Kuiper construction. So, um, so we now focus on point three, okay. The beta holder regularity. To obtain such a regularity, we need to nya, 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 Nash Kuiper methods. So I would like to describe the nash Kuiper method uh, when the south space is just a small compact disk. When I say small, I mean that uh, during the construction, if I need to reduce the size of my disk, well, I will do that without mentioning, mentioning it, okay? So we start with a, a very small uh, disk and uh, with a strictly short embedding, since that's uh, uh, the main ingredient of the recipe. Uh, so with our uh, strictly short embedding, we get this metric. And what we want, what we target, is that one. And there is a difference between what we have and what we would like to have. And this difference is a metric, because uh, F0 is strictly short. and this difference is denoted by delta zero. That's my isometric default. Okay. Now, the central trick is the introduction of an increasing sequence of intermediary metrics. So the picture is the following. You have this metric. And you want to get this one. And Nash tells you don't be too greedy. Don't try to do the wa this all at once, this big leap all at once. Instead, introduce intermediary steps, intermediary goals. So here is my first intermediary goals. This is a, a new metric G1, and the new metric G1 is the, the former one. <gasps> F0, uh, the pullback of by uh, the pullback of the inner product by F0. And I add to this metric half of my isometric default. Then I introduce another metric here. And now the gap is delta zero over four, and so on. 
here delta 0 over 8. So you are going to uh, build, build your isometric uh, map with infinite, with an, uh, an iterative process uh, and uh, an infinite number of steps. So the first step, you are going to build F1 and F1 is, is required to be just approximately an isometry for G1. So you don't want to have exactly G1, just approximately. Once you have F1, you uh, construct from F1 a new map, F2, which is going to be approximately isometric to G2, and so on. What you get is a sequence of map, and we will see that this sequence of map is going to C1 converge toward a limit map, F, which uh, is going to be our desired uh, isometry. So F is going to be uh, not approximately, but exactly isometric. OK, so now we are going to focus on how to build this map. So the Nash Kuiper uh, method builds iteratively the sequence of uh, a sequence of uh, embeddings or immersion depends on uh, on F zero basically. So you start with F zero, and you are going to do three sub steps. And once you have done your three sub steps, what you obtain is your map F1. And then three more sub steps to obtain your map F2, and so on. So why three sub steps? Well, basically because a metric on a surface, well, that's encoded by a two by two matrix, which is uh, symmetric. So basically you have three coefficients. And roughly speaking, what you are doing is you are killing your three coefficients uh, with the three sub steps. How you do that? Well, if you start with F0, so F0 is missing in that uh, slide. So this is F0. What you do basically is that you introduce layer uh, a layer of corrugations and then another layer of corrugation and so on. So that to extend the curves, the length of the curves. So uh, imagine you are focusing on this curve. This curve is too short because our uh, initial map is a strictly short embedding. So you have to extend it and you extend it via a corrugation. And then you add another corrugation in another direction to extend curves on that direction, on that direction, and a third one to extend curves on that direction. And it turns out that three directions are enough since once again your your metric has three coefficients. We are we are working on surfaces. Okay. So if you introduce, uh, of course, you have to choose co conveniently uh, these corrugations, but I don't want to go into these kind of details here. Uh, I would like just to introduce uh, the numbers of corrugations. So at each uh, sub step, you introduce a layer of corrugations. And so you have to decide, that's a free parameter, you have to decide how many corrugations you introduce. And so the number of these corrugations is N11 for the first map, N12 for the second one, N13 for the third. And it turns out that your uh, uh, F1 map, so the map you obtain after uh, three sub steps, well, is C0 close to F0, and this closeness is controlled by your corrugation number via, uh, via this formula. You can see the effect of uh, 
increasing the number of corrugation. Here the number is 10, here 50, and here 100. And you see this uh, closeness phenomenon, uh, which is quite visible in these three pictures. Okay, your uh, corrugation numbers also control the approximation you are doing with the map F1. So F1 is approximately isometric for G1 and the approximation is given by, uh, well, is controlled by the corrugation numbers. Okay, so if your corrugation numbers are uh, large enough, the approximation could be good enough so that uh, um, F1 is approximately isometric for G1, okay, but is also strictly short for G2, since G2 is greater than G1, so that you can iterate your process. So you continue the process, you build your, your sequence, uh, okay, so for the sake of simplicity, uh, well, we have done that before. And here is a crucial uh, inequality mm -hmm. of this construction. So I made a slight simplification. So I ask the specialist for a little understanding here. Uh, so what you are doing is you are controlling the difference of the differential of two consecutive maps. And this difference, it turns out that this difference is bounded by a constant time, the square root of uh, the difference between uh, two consecutive metric. So that means that you are going to control the C1 convergence of F just by controlling the convergence of this series, the series of the square root of the difference of the, uh, of the matrix. So this difference of the metric, so this series is going to control the C1 convergence. And well, we have chosen our intermediary matrix uh, so that uh, this difference, this norm is in fact uh, a geometric series. So what we have uh, in front of us is, is in fact a geometric series. So it is converging, and that's the reason why uh, our sequence of map is C1 converging. OK, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, Nash and Kuiper uh, construction of uh, C1 isometric embedding or immersion from your uh, strictly short map. So now I would like to uh, move on to the case of H2. So there is a big difference between a compact disk and H2 is that H2 is a non-compact and in particular, the hyperbolic metric is blowing up uh, when rho is uh, converging toward one. So in this picture, this axis is the rho axis. Here we are at rho equal one, here at rho equal zero. This axis is the axis of the metric you put on the interior on D2. Okay. So uh, H is brewing up near rho equal one and F0 not because F0 is an immersion defined on D2. So no, uh, no blue up here. That means that the isometric default and uh, the difference of all between all the intermediary metrics in norm over D2, uh, all these numbers are going to be infinite. Uh, so, okay. So, all the intermediary metrics are exploding. And in particular, our uh, isometric default and the difference between two consecutive metrics is going to, uh, to infinity. So uh, Nash and Kuiper um, have a strategy to circumvent this, but I don't want to go into this strategy, so I am going to skip these two remarks just to focus on 
uh, the way we are doing the thing. So we are not uh, following Nash and Kuiper for this part. So for this part, we are going to avoid the use of the, well, we are going to uh, follow another strategy uh, to uh, deal with the non-compactness. We are going to uh, consider an exhaustion of D2 by uh, increasing disk, okay, of concentric disk and, re and radius that tends towards uh, one. And we are going to consider cutoff function. So quickly. So this is rho equal one. Uh, this is a boundary of, say, the disk number n. Here is the boundary of the disk number n plus one. And my cutoff function is, uh, well, an unusual one. So one over the n and zero outside the n plus one. I got it. Okay, that's my epsilon n. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to use these cutoff functions to cut off my intermediary matrix that way. So these are my intermediary matrix, G1, G2, G3, and I cut them. So I cut off uh, G1 at the boundary of D1, G2 at the boundary of D2, and so on. So that my uh, sequence of matrix are no longer exploding. And moreover, Near the, boon, near the boundary here, on a neighborhood of the, of, the, of the boundary, my metric is going to be equal to the pullback metric. Now, I observe that each GN is well defined on the closed disk D2. That means that I am in the compact case. So I can do all the Nash and Kuiper construction we've seen above uh, in, uh, in D2. So uh, this brings us back to a compact, to a compact setting. All right, so now uh, how, I, how we are going to get the uh, beta order regularity. So now we are going to focus on this, on this point so first, the C0 convergence. To uh, get the C0 convergence, I need uh, an extra set of parameters, namely a sequence of positive number, a decreasing sequence of uh, positive number, which is uh, converging. So the series is converging. And uh, during the Nash and Kuiper process, I'm going to choose my corrugation number so that uh, the C0 proximity of two consecutive uh, maps is bounded by uh, tau k. Uh, that means since the series is converging that uh, my sequence fk is uh, C0 converging on the wall D2. Since my metric is unchanged on the boundary of my disk, well, uh, the image, the, the map, each map fk is unchanged on the boundary and the image is unchanged of the boundary. So I get a, a, a map which is bounded by gamma. And uh, obviously, if I uh, compute the norm of the difference of the square root of the difference of two consecutive metric on dn, so dn is a closed disk inside the interior of d2, this is obviously bounded. We basically are in the same uh, setting as uh, in the Nash and Kuiper proof. So this is basically a geometric series. It converges. So if the geometric series converges, it me this means that my sequence of map is going to C1 converge uh, above inside uh, the interior of D2. So we have... Uh, so we get our C1 isometric map on the interior of D2. And now I would 
I'd like to uh, uh, get my uh, uh, older regularity. And to do so, I use uh, the interpolation inequality, which is given here. So the beta older norm of uh, capital F is given by this. And this norm is bounded by a product of the C C1 norm of F to the power beta and the C0 norm of F to the power one minus beta for any beta between uh, zero and one. So, well, this is well known by, const oh, sorry. by construction, this is bounded by tau k to the power one minus beta. So I would like to focus on this term. So this term is controlled by the difference of two consecutive metric, but I have to compute this norm over D2, the closed D2. And uh, since we have explicit expression, we can compute this uh, and get a, a bar, uh, an upper bound, which is a pol polynomial, polynomial in uh, K. So the square root is just bounded by uh, K plus two. That means that the C, the C1 norm of uh, Fk minus Fk minus one is bounded by a constant time K plus two. Now, if I plug this on my uh, interpolation inequality, so I get this, and it is enough to choose toke such that toke is less than an exponential to get a convergence of the of the series of the series for any beta, and we obtain uh, the uh, uh, beta order regularity of f thanks to uh, this last uh, convergence. Okay, why well, my, my time is almost over. So I'm going to skip the proof of uh, result two. Sorry, I would like to jump mm. to uh, result number three. So result number three is an explicit computation, an explicit expression for a C1 isometric embedding of H2 with a limit set, which is uh, in E3, not a planar curve, and which is beta older for any beta less than one, but which is not C1. So that's another case, not covered by the result one or the result two. And uh, as a global map, this isometric embedding is uh, is beta older for any beta less than one. Uh, as it appears in that picture, well, uh, our hyperbolic uh, space is just uh, a simple jar with a limit set which looks like a round circle, but that's because we are too far from uh, the boundary. So this is uh, uh, the area, the spot we would like to zoom in. And if we zoom in, we uh, realize that we have some uh, corrugations on the boundary. Here is another zoom in. And with this other zoom in, we, uh, I, I think that you are convinced that the curve is not planar. So that's a curve in E3. Here is another zoom. <laughs> Ah, oh, sorry. Is that okay for the picture? Yeah. Yeah. You 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 receive it then? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, we are very near to uh, the boundary here, and uh, uh, it is now clear that uh, the boundary curves is a, a piling of corrugations. So in fact, if you uh, take a look at the analytic expression of this uh, limit curve. Well, this analytic expression is very similar to a lacunary Fourier series with the coefficient chosen so that your curve is beta older for any beta less than one, but not C1. So just for the fun, I continue to uh, zoom here. It looks like the path mountain example of uh, of Melanie Taylor and of the uh, 
uh, approximation, uh, autonomic approximation theorem. But that's just a coincidence. Okay, a zoom out. So we are back, uh, a different view, but we are back. And another, another uh, zoom in to this, this region, this spot. And we see uh, once again, new corrugations that, uh, that appear. Okay, my time is over. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? So, as I understand that, uh, like main place where you needed constant uh, curvature metric was uh, when you were constructing short map, right? So that's what the yes, here I uh, uh, exactly, but certainly I can. Uh, well, the construction of short uh, of short maps could certainly be generalized. We have just well. But you're right, you're right. That's a, that, that's a point. You where know, I use a little bit uses for uh, like last place of convergence, you kind of also, uh, you, you were saying you, you had some explicit metric, you had some explicit computation, but this also probably could be true. Yeah. If I have explicit metric, I can do explicit, I, I can hope to have explicit computation and so, and so uh, construct a strictly short map. But in general, uh, you have to, Develop more general arguments, and I, I don't have any of them in mind. So, can I ask a vague and imprecise question? Um, yeah. Is there is there some kind of uniqueness statement that if if you want this kind of uh, C one isometric embedding, that then you must have uh, corrugations occurring, or like that? There, this is kind of a a local model that, that must appear if you want this kind of Nash results. Okay, so uh, if I repeat your question to be sure I, underst I yes. understood you perfectly. Yeah. So you are saying that is the corrugation, uh, well, this piling of corrugations uh, um, a mandatory way to, uh, to get a C1 isometric embedding? That, that's. Yeah. That was your question? Yes. Well, my answer is that that's the only way we know how to do that, to construct, to, to, to build such embedding, but that does not mean that you are forced to, uh, to stack corrugations over corrugations to construct C1, uh, generically to construct C1 isometric embedding. Uh, nevertheless, I think, well, we don't know the answer of your of your uh, question, but certainly if you have to uh, build C1 isometric maps, you have to do uh, something very unusual. And it's difficult to uh, figure out how to uh, replace this piling of uh, corrugations with something uh, completely new. Maybe you, uh, maybe it's impossible, maybe that's a, well, up to obvious modification, well, you can, you have, uh, certainly you have a lot of freedom when you are doing this piling, when you are uh, choosing the shape of your corrugation, et cetera, et cetera. But the general pattern, the general strategy, I have some, well, I am unable to figure out any other strategy to, uh, to build an isometric embedding, generically. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have answered to your question correctly. Uh, it, it was it was a vague question, so that's that's a perfectly good answer. Thank you. But but in general, in order to to construct this map, which is say C one smooth or not C not C two smooth, you have to do something like this where stress process, which is exactly this corrugation. Okay. I, yeah, I guess I'm just reminded of a result in symplectic geometry where um, there there is a unique local model and any kind of result satisfying the H principle must have a certain local model. Um, that, that was the motivation to the question. So. Mm. Uh, 
So I, I, I had a question that I wanted to ask about your, your beautiful uh, visualizations. Uh, I, I was wondering, what is the input? Can, can you just feed uh, a given short, short map and then you have programmed an algorithm that will produce a visualization or, or do you have to do it in concrete cases? How, how no, no, no. a machine do you have? No, 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 you have to, uh, well, the construction is more involved than it appears. Uh, if you want to have, well, beautiful picture, what does that mean? That means pictures with a lot of uh, symmetries. So if you want to have just, for instance, just three sub-steps, this is possible if you uh, are working on a small disk, but if you work on a, on a big piece of your surface, this is not possible in general. So you have to choose very carefully your uh, initial short map to have a hop to get the beautiful pictures. So uh, for the moment, we are really unable, if you give me just a short map, oh, is that, that's a short map, uh, go on. Well, I, I will be unable to produce any picture uh, because uh, I would have to uh, do that locally then the computation are going to be very, uh, very huge and uh, the computer is going to crash down and so on. What about for other corrugation schemes, like for wrinkling of embeddings or, or stuff like that? Have you, have you tried with visualizations for, for that kind of thing? Sorry, uh, retrying with what, sorry? Uh, like like uh, for, for wrinkling type corrugations, are, are, have you tried any visualizations? Recurring, sorry, I, I, there is one word I, I am unable to understand. Recurring corrugation, you yeah, like like when you're when you're changing, um, if, if if you have an embedding and you start deforming the Gauss map, then then there is a way to approximate that deformation by introducing some wrinkles, and presumably you can also get some very beautiful pictures there. Okay, so. Your question is to replace corrugation by wrinkles? No, it's, it's, it's another, it's, it's a different problem, just another problem that would be very beautiful to visualize. Ah, okay, okay, okay I, I get it, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, visualization uh, of wrinkles could certainly be very uh, informative. Uh, uh, I'm not ready to enter into that because um, because I have many other things to do right now, but I encourage you if you are interested in, in visualization to do that. <laughs> it's a topic for the next workshop. Okay, I think we should uh, uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.